All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the 10th installment of California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. So it's a new month and a, a new chapter for the series uh, here in, now that we're in June. Over the next few weeks, our host, Elaine Chacon Brown, will lead conversations with some outstanding producers dedicated to illustrating California terroir through the lens of classic grape varieties, Zinfandel, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon. While the conversations offer a deeper understanding of these varieties and the role they play in the history of California wine, more importantly, we hope they reveal the new directions grape growers and winemakers are headed in the way they cultivate and work with them in the cellar. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming two winemakers who are producing world-class Chardonnay at two of California's historic wineries, Stefan Vivier of Stony Hill Vineyard and Michael McNeil of Henzel Vineyards. So first, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. Uh, please ensure you have your Zoom screen set to speaker view. Uh, there should be an option to select it in the top right corner of your screen. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use, a chat section as well as a Q&A section. So these are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Uh, just please be sure to select everyone in the to field uh, as it can default to panelists only. So then there's the Q&A section, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and our guests to answer towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we will do our best to address your questions, but please know that if any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you will receive following the program. So in this email, we will also provide a list of export markets for the wineries represented. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and as contributing writer to Wine and Spirits magazine, um, as well as a long list of respective publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. And Stefan and McNeil. Stefan's current portfolio of work includes Stony Hill Vineyard, Longmeadow Ranch, Anderson Valley, and other respected boutique wineries in the Russian River Valley, Sonoma Coast, and Rutherford Appalachians. He is a consultant winemaker at Hyde de Vilaine and oversees his own label, Vivier Wine. McNeil has spent many years and worked with dozens of vineyards throughout California and Oregon. He joined Hansel in 2008, where he seeks to produce wines that best express the special and unique qualities of Sonoma Valley. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. I am so excited to have both Stefan and McNeil here. I have spent a surprising amount of time on Chardonnay, and especially California Chardonnay, in my work in wine. And to have the two of you here, it's really quite an honor. Both of you have spent so much time understanding the variety and working with vineyards all over the state. And so getting to talk about Chardonnay with both of you is a thrill. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to actually go ahead and just dig right in. You know, it's, it's pretty unique in this series to have both of you on to really talk about um, the technicalities, the history, and the fun of the variety. And so I want to go ahead and just start straight away. Let's look at some maps just to orient ourselves. Both of you um, today are talking about estate programs, and so let's just look at where the vineyards are and talk about um, what makes them unique. Now, um, Katie's showing the full California map just so we can orient ourselves. You can see there the black box highlights what we're going to zoom into, but do notice that it is still relatively close to the Pacific Ocean and directly above the um, San Francisco Bay, San Pablo Bay complex. So if we go into the next screen, this is again the same box highlighted. Um, again, you can see the proximity to the bay, and this will be important as we talk through the vineyards. Um, there's Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley, which is within Sonoma County. And now let's go to the next map. Okay, here we can see Napa Valley and then also Sonoma Valley. And if, if um, Katie could highlight right down the middle, of course, is the Mayacomas Range. And you can see the boundary between Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley kind of follows the ridge line of the Mayacamas. But notice that Stony Hill is there in the, uh, in the Spring Mountain District of Napa Valley. 
and on the exact same ridge line, but just a sli slightly further south and on, on the western side is Hansel Vineyards there in Sonoma Valley. So we're in both cases, we're talking about mountain vineyards. They both have volcanic soils and are at slightly high elevation. So let's start with um, Stony Hill. Stefan, could you just tell us a little bit more about, about the estate, about the vineyards there at Stony Hill? Good, good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, hello. So um, Stony Hill Vineyards, um, the property um, was purchased in uh, 19, uh, 1943. And the first planting was 1948, so right after World War II. Um, first vintage, um, commercial vintage was 1952. A um, couple of vintage were made uh, prior to that. Um, the Macre purchased uh, um, the, the, the estate um, right back then in 1943. So um, the property is um, the main planting uh, between 800 feet elevation and uh, 15, 1700 feet elevation is a mostly white uh, varieties and uh, mostly comprised of Chardonnay mm -hmm. and a little bit of Gewürztraminer and a little bit of Riesling. Um, we also have um, uh, small quantities, small uh, plantings of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah. It's important to note though that historically Stony Hill and Hansel are really two of the most important um, wineries in the state of California and, at, and especially for Chardonnay. Stony Hill actually was the first new winery to open following the close of prohibition in 1933, but it was also the first um, along with Mayakamas to knowingly plant Chardonnay in Napa Valley. Uh, it turned out we found, discovered later Inglenook accidentally had some mixed in with the Riesling planting, but that was unknown and it was in no way being bottled or treated as Chardonnay. So Stony Hill actually emerging as the first new winery after Prohibition and as a white winery focused um, house is really quite significant. Now, the, the, oh, go ahead. The, the, Macri, the Macri had a, a love for uh, white burgundies and uh, decided to plant the property 100% with Chardonnay and they were talked um, out of it uh, by um, experts at uh, UC Davis and so that's, a, that's the reason why there's a little bit of a uh, Whistling and gave us stamina at the time. There have been also some Pinot Blanc uh, planting as well. Well, and so then Stony Hill actually gave cuttings to Hansel, and so there's actually a strong link between the two wineries. And so, McNeil, would you go ahead and tell us more about the estate there? I'd like to. I'd love to. Um, so, uh, Hansel was founded by Ambassador James Zellerbach. And when he was in Europe administering the Marshall Plan after World War II, uh, he fell in love with the wines of Burgundy, and it became his dream to uh, make wines of significance here in his native California. So uh, in 1948, he found this property. Uh, it's a 200-acre estate uh, running from about uh, 450 feet in elevation up to uh, a little over 800 feet. Um, and so uh, he purchased the property in 1948. And in 1953, he planted two acres of Chardonnay and four acres of Pinot Noir. So now we have uh, to date uh, 46 acres under vine. But when he went to plant the Chardonnay, he did get his budwood from, uh, from the McRae Ranch. So it's a nice link. That's it. Well, and and it's also interesting because the McCrae's got their cuttings from the Wente family, but mm -hmm. actually before, um, before any sort of virus treatment um, was done to their Chardonnay vines. So it's really actually quite a historic selection that both Stony Hill and Hansel are hosting there on the property properties. Yeah, yeah this, this is correct. And um, so small, small clusters, small berries, um, we, we can talk, um, a long time about concentration and small yield and the fact that both both estates are um, on steep hillsides. Um, I mean Stony Hill is pretty much on a cliff and um, so really shallow really shallow volcanic uh, soil so uh, tiny yield um, bringing all that uh, concentration in the wine and uh, and but I, I want to being being obviously French and from Burgundy um, I want I want to link a little bit earlier, more like a century before, 
the, the provenance of the, uh, old, the, the Wenti, what we call Wenti, old Wenti, and there's many names now um, um, in, uh, in the world uh, for, for, that, for, those, for those cuttings, but they come from uh, Premier Cru Merceau mm -hmm. um, vineyards that were brought um, back into the Livermore region um, by uh, Charles Whitmore back then in the 18, 1890s and passed to the, um, to the uh, Wenty family. So this, um, this heirloom heritage uh, uh, selection are so, so important um, to the, I mean, Chardonnay world heritage. So. Well, and both, both wineries have that direct link back to France, um, both in terms of inspiration, um, you know, what was inspiring the founding of each winery, but then also, as Stefan is pointing out, in terms of literal um, vine material, can be linked all the way back to France, which is really quite remarkable. And, and mm -hmm. the two wineries, as I said, help really establish the, the kind of new history of fine wine in California. Stony Hill with help, helping to things to reopen after prohibition. And then Hansel really importantly, um, also doing work on the technical side with um, the first uh, controlled malolactic conversion in North America, and also uh, the first temperature controlled fermentation tanks in California. Now, one of the things that I really want to focus on today, though, you know, both of you come from wineries of incredible legacy, really incredible historical relevance. But the truth is that um, both Stony Hill and Hansel have also continued to move forward, continued to hone the winemaking and the viticulture. And um, let's just start with on the farming side. Each, each of your wineries has really kind of shifted and upgraded how you think of farming. And I, I'd love for each of you to talk about that. Do you want to go ahead and start, McNeil? How, what uh, you're sure. doing, Hansel? Yeah, uh, you know, we've come a long ways in terms of our, our farming practices. Uh, when I got here, we were, you know, uh, conventional farming. Um, and we slowly, uh, you know, started incorporating a lot of cover crops into the pro program. Uh, and now we've got, we've embraced a, uh, I hate to call it biodynamic, but it's, it's more of a uh, biological farming um, through biodiversity. We've brought animals on the property, really trying to build the uh, soil microbiology. And the way we do that is through grazing animals through the property, um, really trying to create a, a closed system. So uh, we're not importing uh, outside inputs into the, onto the ranch. Yeah, something that, that um, some people call that would be like a complete farm model or a, you know, a, a full farm model so that the, the property actually creates its own resources um, rather than having to import outside um, nutrients in order to support the, the vines there. Yeah, and exactly. Stefan, um, you know, Long Meadow Ranch at Stony Hill has really um, helped integrate, create a more integrated model as well, would you like to talk about that? Yes, correct, and I will echo a little bit uh, McNeil's comment and, and the shift at uh, uh, Stony Hill Vineyards into organic farming and um, Long Meadow Ranch um, has been, is, is farming uh, organically um, all, their, um, all their, their, their branches. And uh, there's a lot of new names now, um, yeah. of course, uh, organic and, and biodynamic. Um, are the the the, the biologic uh, we call in 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 French and um, uh, now we have the regenerative farming and and um, so that that's it's so it's all included into uh, this uh, really uh, broad um, uh, look into the ground the soil the terroir. Uh, working uh, a lot with the soil, like Michael was saying, like making uh, the microbiology and the, the life around the, uh, the vines uh, really alive and, and living and 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 um, and really part of the uh, of the ecosystem. So and, uh, I think that's, that's helping helping the uh, helping of course uh, the the health of the of the vines so at at, at uh, long meadow ranch and stony hill vineyards we are using an uh, we have a term called full circle farming um, because we do have uh, animals we have uh, um, organic farms and everything has um, the input as an output in into the the next uh, part of the uh, of the farming cycle 
So it's really important to uh, the whole family uh, to farm that way. And it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. McNeil, you know, you've been doing that a little bit longer at, at Hanzel. I mean, you personally, having been there a little bit longer too, could you speak to, how, you know, what effect do you see this with the vines and also with the wine quality? Well, it's a, it's a very slow process, obviously. Um, but I think more than anything, we're seeing in the vineyards, um, uh, see the vines being able to respond to stress a lot better um, in terms of heat stress, drought stress. Uh, we've managed to cut our, uh, our water inputs, uh, as much as how much we irrigate, uh, probably by 75%. Um, which is, is huge. Um, you know, we are now farming organically as well. And uh, I guess from, from a human standpoint, it feels better to be in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the vines just uh, look and feel healthier. Uh, as far as the wine chemistry, uh, it's really hard to say how it's changed because we don't have a control. We don't have right, our... Yeah. Uh, 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 conventionally farmed mm -hmm. side and, and the organically farmed side. And so we can't really uh, uh, say what the effect is, but I can, I can for sure say that uh, the vines uh, handle the stress of heat waves and uh, a, a lot better. So, Well, and we do actually know that um, different types of stress create flavor markers in, in the fruit. And so, you know, even if we can't have the direct contrast, we can, we can assume based on scientific studies that there is a shift happening in the resulting wine as well. Now, one of the things that I want to be sure to address though, too, is, you know, when a, when a winery, especially an iconic, well-known historic winery is sold, it creates a lot of stress in the wine community. You know, avid wine lovers get worried, oh my God, it'll never be the same. But I think that, uh, you know, Hansel is a is such an important example of how um, the right owners, even with change of ownership, really help steward that the nature of the of the vineyards and the winery and really help maintain that. And I know you've seen that at Hansel. And Stefan, I have to say that when Long Meadow Ranch purchased Stony Hill, I had already spent quite a bit of time in the vineyard and really was um, keeping an eye on the choices that Long Meadow Ranch would make. But when I found out that you would be the winemakers leading Stony Hill, I was quite relieved. I, I, um, you know, one of the first conversations that you and I ever had in wine several years ago now was just about how much you admire legacy and that sense of getting to know a vineyard over time. And so could you tell us a little more about how, how you were working to bring that legacy forward and, and the work you've literally done with Mike Cellini in, in regards to that too. Yeah, so um, it, 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 comes, it comes back to um, me being like a, a young kid and learning um, um, to make wine. Um, um, my first mentors asked me to, um, to ask a lot of questions. And uh, so that's always what, I, what I'm doing when I'm uh, going to someplace new, um, even if I knew Stony Hill and of course with my work at High de Vilaine and Stony Hill and Hansel has constantly, constantly been uh, included into testing of our, of our pairs. But uh, um, the time spent with uh, uh, Mac Cellini and, and at uh, Stony Hill and being able to go into his red books and and uh, discussion with him are uh, uh, just key to uh, to fast track um, your 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 knowledge into uh, into the uh, the site. So uh, asking the right question at the right time um, uh, just usually leads to the right to the right answer. Um, so it's it's really important to um, to see what what's been done because um, uh, obviously, as you said, like coming to those wineries that have a, a legacy already in uh, 67 years, 68 years. Now I'm only the third winemaker, uh, the third winemaker. So it's, um, you have to be able to understand where they come from, what, what's been done and uh, their understanding of the, uh, of the side, the, uh, their life and um, all this and, and being able to translate this into uh, then the new generation. So I, I, 
to to interpret what it is now and to also interpret what is going to be in the next 67. So my work at, at Stony Hill Vineyard is really to uh, to build the foundation for the next 67 years mm-hmm. or more. And uh, this all comes from the foundation that came from Burgundy, where like um, we we don't we don't view the vineyard as um, as now we view the vineyard that what they're going also going to be with our son or daughters or grandson and granddaughters and uh, with always this in mind. So the farming, the dry farming, the full circle farming, organic farming, all this as a uh, as a long really a long view, a long term um, uh, view and relationship with uh, with with the site. And so uh, being n- newer. Uh, and being the new um, steward of the uh, of the land and, and of the wine uh, of such places, um, there, there's a big uh, dig up to be done in history, um, and uh, this can be done without really much um, just just by uh, questioning. Uh, Michelini was Michelini yes. was uh, was was absolutely incredible. So. Well, and we should clarify too that Mike, um, you know, Mike moved to Stony Hill on 1970. He, by the time he retired at the end of 2018, he, be, he was the longest tenured winemaker in Napa Valley. And he was also the longest tenured Chardonnay winemaker in North America. So that's really quite big shoes to fill. But I know that you actually spent the entire 2018 vintage essentially shadowing Mike to make, make the wines alongside him. And then 2019 is the first vintage that you've now made um, on your own. And, and you've been actually having Mike come back to taste with you to see, to see if he still think it, thinks it honors Stony Hill. We were together last Wednesday. Yes, that's great. Well, so I have to say, though, McNeil, of course, has had um, really big shoes to fill as well. Bob Sessions is a legend in the history of California wine, and he really helped mm-hmm. make uh, his own mark with Hansel. And McNeil, you've already gone through this process of, of really, you know, studying his notebook, studying the historic wines, studying the site and getting to know it. So what advice do you have to Stefan to keep in mind? Well, I think, I think more than anything, he's, he's got it spot on and in that it's, it's about asking questions and, uh, and listening to uh, what the wines say, what, what the, the, you know, the history of the property has said in the past. Um, and I think more than anything, uh, as a winemaker, it's really about sort of subverting your own ego because uh, most most of us uh, have a good size ego. Uh, we want we, we have our own ideas and we want to put those forward. But at the same time, it's about respecting uh, the history and legacy of of these properties. And um, you know, I, when I came to Hansel, uh, my my attitude was sort of uh, uh, it ain't broke, uh, so so don't try and fix it. And so I was just really about uh, listening and and uh, just taking it in and seeing how to best uh, approve upon it uh, in the future. Yeah, no, it's so important. So let's go ahead and start looking at some wines. The first, um, what we're going to do today is talk about current release wines for each um, winery 2017 um, for Stony Hill and 2017 for Hansel. And then we're going to look at some slightly older um, vintages, one from each as well. So let's go ahead and start with Stony Hill 2017. I'm excited to hear each of your responses to each other's wines as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just jump in. Yeah. Uh, The, the Stony Hill, this 2017, to me, it's just classic Stony Hill. Um, and, and like Stefan, um, uh, Stony Hill has been in uh, many, many, many uh, of, of our tastings just to look at, you know, it's sort of one of those uh, uh, touchstone wines. And uh, this has just the classic uh, apple, apple skin, uh, floral quality, but also this real deep minerality that yeah. uh, I really find attractive. No, it ends up being savory and really palate stimulating mm-hmm. um, that, that mineral element that you're talking about. Um, you know, in, I've actually shown both Stony Hill and Henzel quite a lot in, um, in seminars, you know, to audiences around the world and even around the world. Just in October, I was in um, Hong Kong and did a California Chardonnay seminar 
that opened with Stony Hill and Hansel. And there was really, you know, wonderfully positive response to both wines and to the seminar as a whole. But part of, part of why was, you know, these wines emulate a kind of classic character for the variety and really speak to a, a moment in time and, and a kind of a window into the past, yet it, with, with wines that are at the same time so incredibly current, you know, there's so much about freshness, so much about um, flavor with drive, you know, and that mineral crunchy element as well. And, um, you know, they, they kind of, they break the, the expected stereotype for anybody that thinks that California Chardonnay is just the bigger style of wine. These really break that stereotype, you know, Stefan, do you want to um, add comments to about the 17 as you retaste it? And um an old, an old mentor in uh, Burgundy um, was this, has always described um, Chardonnay as a queen, the queen of the grapes. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I, use a, I use the line a lot, but maybe too much. Um, Chardonnay is uh, always standing really straight up and um, has really a, a, a statue about it. And uh, it can be a lot about extreme. And Stone Hill for me has this... Um, uh, what you can find in, in Chardonnay, some extreme um, opulence with minerality at the same time, um, a back, uh, backbone of um, uh, very mineral and savory backbone. Uh, but around it, it, those wines can be uh, fairly, fairly opulent, and that exp which, which I explained with, of course, the side, uh, the, the hillside, and the steepness, and, and the low yield, and the dry, dry farming. Yeah. So this was always what I, 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 I like in, in Chardonnay, but also in wine in general, is those, those extreme and these complexities that, um, that, that, that goes with, uh, with wine. And I'm, I'm, that, that goes with age, sorry, um, with aging of the wine, of course, mm -hmm. Hensel and, and Stonehill are both, um, both um, known for being able to age for, for decades. Yes. And yeah. that's... Uh, uh, that what, what I, if I, if I, if I want to, to, to bring something into wine, it's just like, I, I want the wine to taste nice right at right of the bad, but also nice in, 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 in 20, 25 years and have the same characteristic mm -hmm. during its aging. And, um, on then the first, the primary, secondary and tertiary, um, uh, layers are adding up to the complexity yes. of the, uh, of the, of the wine and the history. Um, so, um, well, and we I can think talk about aging some more with the older vintages yeah. too. Yeah. So let's go ahead and look at Hansel and Stefan. I want to hear your response to it's, it, it's really, it's great having them side by side, save vintage like this. Cause you can see, um, you can see the contrasting character. There's a, um, there's an opulence in Stony Hill that you find here with Hansel with, a. uh, uh First, f fruit, uh, very uh, fruit and floral characters that are really um, dominant in the uh, 2017. It's a beautiful forward floral. Um, the wine is so extremely focused and mm -hmm. precise, mm -hmm. and uh, I love this about about Chardonnays. It's um, it's it's really really focused um, and um, and extremely long at the same time. Yes. And yes. also the, the minerality is, a, uh, is also coming at the end. It's a little bit less, um, the Stony Hill has more of that savor, savory minerality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, the, the Hansel, the minerality is, uh, um, uh, is, is more like a salty, salty and floral minerality, more the clove character versus Stony Hill will be more the pepper and, um, and, and, and a little bit yeah, more peppery white peppery character mm -hmm. and savory character. The Hansel, it's so interesting having them side by side because I feel like as the Hansel comes into the mouth, it, op it opens a little bit more broadly. It's still a very focused wine, but compared to the Stony Hill, the Hansel has a little more breadth it, at, when it first comes in, but then it just like mm -hmm. tightens up and you know, drives through the mouth. It gets incredibly long, um, where, whereas the Stony Hill right now Kind of keeps its focus, stays focused, and goes really long right from the beginning. But I, but part of the character of Stony Hill is very much about intentionally being made so that its flavor is about that aging character that develops over time too. We're getting a lot of contrast, and I want to I want to address the technical questions without without um, 
putting all of our attention on it. But one of the important questions with Chardonnay is the ML question. Um, I actually had some, some people email me in advance and demand that I ask you both <laughs> to talk about malolactic conversion. So I don't want to get completely sidetracked, but I do want us just briefly to address, you know, what is the role of ML or not in each of these wines and what and how are um, oak and, and overall aging handled in each of the wines. So just briefly, Stefan, if you could address that with Stony Hill and then McNeil with Hansel. Briefly is briefly yeah, is going to be hard. hard. I know. Um, <laughs> Good luck, Stefan. Uh, first, as a <laughs> as a winemaker, and, and just as uh, Mike Neal was saying, um, I consider myself more as a ghost, and um, and so I, I like to be as 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 little influence as possible on the wines, and the 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 site is going to de dictate really um, some of the techniques. Um, so technical, technical winemaking is, uh, um, is hard here because, um, it leads people to, uh, to compare and, uh, it's not, it's not always things that can be yes. compared. I come yes. from Burgundy where malolactic is, um, is a given. Um, I make a lot of, uh, full malolactic wine here in California yeah. that are, uh, that are labeled as uh, really acidic. So, um, uh, I, I, I just like a quick disclaimer. Um, so Stony Hill, Stony Hill Vineyard is, a, uh, is one of those properties where um, malolactic has not been um, uh, rendered uh, for all these years. So um, we stop the wine after the alcoholic fermentation and just an average vintage to give you some technical level here. It's going to be uh, stop at around like two. I mean, the, the levels are usually about two and a quarter grams per liter of uh, malic acid. And um, which leaves us with, uh, if you pick right, um, at about like 13 and a half percent alcohol and level of acidity between six and a half and seven and a half grams per liter of um, titrable acidity. Excuse my French. Um, so that's, I want to go very fast here because um, uh, it's, it's something that's uh, historically also um, in this northern part of, um, of, uh, of Napa Valley. I mean, it, it can get hot. And I was mm -hmm. um, mentioning like 67 years ago, I mean, the microwave were like a little bit uh, looked at for planting only Chardonnay. And now 67 years from now, no longer the ranch, we just replanting Chardonnay. And no, there's always a question that comes with malolactic that is a global warming and that is uh, climate change. And uh, so what direction are changing? We do a lot of work on the canopy management so that we, uh, we, do, um, we do have balanced wines, complex wines yes. that, um, that, that are made for the aging and also have a, a lot of finesse and elegance. So malolactic fermentation for, um, for Stony Hill vineyards, uh, we've not done it. Um, well, and it's, I think historically, I mean, we, we looked at uh, Mayaka Mas, uh, uh, um, Chateau Montelena at, at the same time. It's like historically, uh, those wineries were also um, at the beginning using a lot of uh, sulfur. Uh, if you read the, the yes. book uh, from, from Fred and Peter, and they were using a lot of sulfur. So malolactic fermentation were pretty hard. And um, so I think this, this tradition came, came back and, and stayed at, at Stony Hill all these years uh, to bring um, wine like, um, like, like this and with that same savory character. Yes, if I could jump in for a second. They, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to um, his, you know, winemakers that have been in, in California for decades and also reading old um, oral transcripts of interviews with different winemakers. And, and actually what you find is that there is a period where wine simply didn't go through malolactic conversion. And, and when Stony Hill got started, my understanding is it simply didn't, you know, the, with the techniques that were normal at the time, the wine simply didn't go through malolactic conversion. And speaking, mm -hmm. spending a lot of time with Mike Cellini, you know, he would emphasize again and again, I make the wines the way Fred McRae taught me to. And and he really stuck to that. And now he's passed that on to you, Stefan. But what we've discovered is that, like you were talking about, the choice of malolactic or not is also a way of helping to establish balance in the wine. So if you have a warmer site, um, not going through malolactic can help maintain freshness. If you have um, a, a, a site that has too much natural acidity at 
harvest, you can go through and it helps soften it a little bit. But McNeil, there's a whole history of importance around malolactic um, conversion at Hansel too. And, and Hansel again, um, through Brad Webb was the first winery in North America to actually have a controlled malolactic conversion. So could you talk to us a little bit about the role there at Hensel? Yeah, well, when, when Brad Webb was doing that research uh, and, and found what we now know as uh, ML34, um, he, was, he was actually doing that for Pinot Noir because mm -hmm. they were finding that uh, the Pinot Noir was not finishing ML. So uh, at that time, the Chardonnay uh, was, was uh, you know, they, they stopped or prevented malactic fermentation. Um, so... Uh, but now, if I can go yes, ahead. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so at Hansel, um, the way we handle our fruit um, is a bit unique in that we crush the fruit, um, don't destem, but but all of the, the Chardonnay goes through a crusher, uh, and we'll wait uh, a minimum of two hours before we load the press. Uh, uh, to press the, the juice off. Uh, we actually want some of the phenolic extraction. Um, as you were talking about, uh, the, end, the finish of the wine kind of gets kind of tight. That is, I think, in part, the, the phenolics of the wine. Um, so then after two days of cold settling, uh, we will take 25% of that juice and put it to new French oak barrels uh, where the wine ferments. Uh, those barrels... Uh, uh, do go through malactic fermentation. Uh, we promote it uh, and it stays in barrel for uh, 12 months. Uh, and then after that 12 months, we pull it out of barrel up to tank and hold it in tank for six months. The other 75% of the juice uh, is tank fermented uh, with no ML uh, and stays there for six months in tank. Uh, we then put it to older barrel for 12 months. So then after that total of 18 months of elevage, we then blend and bottle. So it's a, it's a very unique way of, uh, of making wine, but uh, you know, it, it, it works. Well, and both really speak to, again, a historical moment in California winemaking and a style that came out of sort of necessity at a point in time, but now have given new insight again into how to create balance um, through these kinds of choices that we're making. But both mm -hmm. Sto Stony Hill and Hansel, again, as Stefan mentioned earlier, are really, really known for ageability, really very importantly so. So let's go ahead and start looking at the modestly aged vin uh, vintages. We'll start with the Stony Hill 2011. Um, last year, though, I was actually able to do a Hansel, Hansel retrospective tasting um, in LA that went all the way back to 1960. We tasted so many wines, it, it was done over three days. And I... I bring this up because the 1960 Chardonnay from Hansel was incredibly worth drinking. It was mm -hmm. one of my standout wines from, from the three days. And, and that, my love for it was not only from nostalgia. It was not simply a, it was an incredible honor to taste that wine, but it really was genuinely beautiful and drinkable. You know, the oldest, um, um, Stony Hill Chardonnay that I've had was a 1982, about three years ago. And again, an incredibly beautiful wine, um, really wonderfully worth drinking. But, you know, and so they're just examples of how, how well Chardonnay from houses like this can age. And so looking at the 2011, again, when, when you put it in that broader scope, 2011, and, that, and then we'll taste 2013 from Hansel. That's very modest aging, actually, for each of these wineries. But um, McNeil, I'd love to hear your thoughts on 2011. You and I have spent a lot of time talking about what a great vintage 11 was for California Chardonnay. So how does yeah. this stand out to you? Uh, it's very, it, to me, it really speaks of the vintage. Um, uh, the, the Stony Hill uh, 2011 uh, is very similar, actually, to the Hansel mm -hmm. 2011 in that there's this um, very strong, I refer to it as uh, machine oil or kind of a, a fusel oil, uh, that, that uh, wonderful petrol quality that you can get out of uh, a beautiful aged uh, Riesling. Uh, that it, it's unexpected, I think, uh, for most people to, to smell and taste that in a Chardonnay. They're, they don't expect it. 
Um, but I just think it's gorgeous. I love it. It's this real incredible minerality. Um, and there's a, an oiliness in the wine too that mm-hmm. comes through. Well, and, um, you know, speaking with Mike, he spent a lot of time talking about how, you know, Fred McRae said to him, you know, the wine's not meant to be ready for 10 years, you know, yeah. and so we've got about 10 years now with this 2011. And Stefan, you know, ha- again, you're, you know, you weren't there in 2011. So how is it for you tasting this wine? What stands out to you about it? Um, I, I made Chardonnay in 2011. Yeah, no, of course, yes. <laughs> no, that's Tony Hill Vineyards. And, uh, um, I, I can I can see the, the vintage here. 2011 was a cold vintage, was a rainy vintage early on. Um, of course, this, all these wines, uh, the 2011 Stony Hill was of, obviously harvested after, uh, before, excuse me, before yes. the rain, yes. uh, uh, mm-hmm. early in October. But uh, 2011 um, has been the longest season uh, in record between bloom and, and harvest. I've seen, I have experience in, um, in, um, in, in Northern California and my first vintage was 1999 mm-hmm. and, um, which was also a, a, an extremely, extremely long, long vintage. Um, I remember harvesting Chardonnay, um, from the true coast, uh, in Sonoma on November 6th in, two, in 1999, wow. Wow. but 2011, um, because of this hang time, this natural hang time. And here we're talking about wine with like, a, a balanced level of, uh, of of alcohol you have that it brings that like McNeil was saying that oiliness mm-hmm. into it and uh, now we have layers of almond and a little bit of, um, of vanilla as well um, and a honey character um, coming up um, and and softening the savory uh, the stony hill savory uh, trademark characters mm-hmm. so um yeah, I can I can see I can see the eleven vintage in this where like things were so slow and so cold and um which is so great for Chardonnay. Chardonnay yeah, it just wants to deepens go, all the flavors, yeah. Chardonnay yeah. wants to go slow and Mother Nature is really what decide a lot of the Chardonnay descriptors uh the last three weeks, the last two to three weeks um uh, of ripening are key for Chardonnay and going to and if it goes too fast, it's usually um we 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 landing landing into vintage that are usually a little bit less uh, complex and layered. Mm. And so we love we love cold um, cold cold ripening and and slow ripening. Well, and I I, I can see that in this wine. I would love that we were able to bring a 2011 into this discussion because it's um, you know it's such a great example of reminding us what are we when we make claims about a vintage what are we actually talking about you know and so you know, it's pretty well established 2011 was a challenging vintage for California. And some people are less enamored of, of um, 2011 because of that. But actually, if you really push into that conversation, a lot of times what people really mean is that they, um, they have difficulty with some of the Cabernets from 2011. But actually, 2011 was a perfect vintage for Chardonnay. It, it picks a little sooner, so it came in before the rains, but also that long, slow development like you're talking about is so great for this particular variety. And so it's, it's important to, mm-hmm. to, to clarify what we're talking about in that regard. The, yeah, um, I, would, I would echo that, uh, uh, that Hansel, uh 1998 and 2011 are probably the two best vintages uh, we've seen here. And, and those two vintages are the most maligned uh, yeah. in the press be, just because unfortunately uh, California wines are often judged just by Napa Cabernet. Uh, and uh, you know, California is a much more diverse yes. and uh, 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 yeah, diverse growing place than, than just Napa Cabernet. Well, and I will, I will quickly say that there are a lot of good um, Napa Cabernets from both 98 and 11, um, but it, yes. they were difficult vintages and they did demand people to pay attention in a different sort of way. But let's go ahead and talk about um, Hansel 2013. Stefan, let's start with you. What, what stands out to you in, with this wine? I, I, I really, uh, really love this 2013. It has a lot of complexity in the nose. It's very intense. Um, it has a little bit less fruit that you will find in the 17 at this time. Um, it is really strong in, um, 
in, it has a very strong spice influence. Mm -hmm. um, so really complex because you have the, the, the floral, the spice, a um, little bit of that uh, Hansel fruit still. Um, it's actually super Burgundian. Yeah. Um, I will compare this to some, to some Chassagne um, uh, easily. Um, it has a, really a, a good breath about it. It's a, it's a complete, complete wine. And um, what I love um, about the wine is how precise again it is in, on the palate and mm -hmm. so fresh, precise. It's a baby still. And uh, um, 2013 was a low, uh, low yielding year. Um, the first year of the, uh, of the drought, so very dry as well. And I, I, I can see that here. It has a, a lot of that spice, uh, dryness into it, but it's a really well uh, packaged. And um, I love that 13. It uh, will be a great dinner wine. Yeah. So, Mikhail, you, of course, were at Hansel in 13 and in 17. So what are, what are some of the important things for us to keep in mind about, you know, with each of the vintages and how they differ? Well, I think for both uh, the Stony Hill wines and Hansel, I think the, the thing to keep in mind is that our sites and, and the quality of the fruit that we grow kind of transcend vintage in many ways. Um, not to say that vintage isn't important, um, but uh, the quality of the fruit is, is paramount. And, and uh, you know, 13, yes, it was the beginning of the drought years. Um, we actually had pretty decent yields that year, um, but 13 was just sort of a, a, a very even uh, vintage in terms of uh, not a whole lot of heat waves and, and intensity of heat, uh, just a very even uh, growing season. Um, but I think at this point with, you know, four more years of development in the bottle, uh, you're starting to see some of those secondary uh, uh, aromas and flavors develop. And, uh, and that's what I think is exciting is that uh, there's a real, uh, Matt Kramer said it really well. He said, uh, when, when these wines age and develop, uh, it becomes uh, Chardonnay and stereo, uh, just much more broad and, and a lot more going on in the mouth and in, and in the aromas. And uh, it's just really fun. So great. I, um, so we're, we're actually almost out of time, but I want to, I want to ask each of you, um, Quick, you know, unfortunately, quickly. What do you want to know from the other one? What do, What do you want to ask, Stefan? Why don't you go go first? What do you want <laughs> What do you want to ask Mikhail? You have him on the spot. The whole world is watching. We've got over twenty countries on right now. What do you want Mikhail to tell you? Um, I, I. It's a hard I question, <laughs> Mikhail. Do you? Um. Um. How do you how, how do you prepare? How, how, how are you guys uh, preparing um, your canopies and your uh, your spring um, to these like uh, freak events uh, that we have year, year in year out now? Well, we don't uh, we don't do a whole lot of um, leaf pulling, um, pretty minimal, um, but more about uh, uh, shoot thinning and um, uh, canopy placement. Um, we use a, a, a V trellis and uh, we really find it works incredibly well here because uh, it kind of creates this little umbrella over the fruit zone so we don't get any, um, any sunburn um, and it, it really makes for a nice uh, phenolic development in the wines. Could I just clarify for people that are unfamiliar? So instead of having the, the shoots the, or the canopy of the vine go yeah. straight up, like vertical shoot positioning would be, just to make sure we, I'm clear, the, a V trellis, you're saying you have the, the canopy open this way, right? So it comes yeah. from the trunk and splits into, which creates an, yeah. a, an umbrella. As, you, as you're looking down the row, uh, instead of it being like this, it's, it's opened up. Uh, the fruit. Uh, right. And so then the leaves in, in that crux. umbrella over and create shading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll open uh, enough for airflow. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. fascinating because at Stony Hill this year, we also um, uh, switched to uh, switch back um, pretty much the whole Chardonnay uh, blocks to uh, uh, head pruning. 
and we do have that. Uh, so it's a special special mm -hmm. head pruning when you look at the, the vine from the top, the buds are, it looks like a, a, a it's like a spiral ladder. It's a spiral, a spiral. So cool. we, uh, we space the, uh, the, the canes this way and, and we have the same. So we removed actually all the trellis. We removed the, uh, the, um, the, um, the wires. Um, and so you can uh, move towards the vineyards everywhere, but uh, it has this uh, a great sprawling feel um, um, to, to it as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. McNeil, is there anything you want to ask Stefan before we finish up? Uh, yeah, something very important, uh, Stefan. Uh, when are we going skiing again? <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about it yesterday. Um, <laughs> I have some great plan. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually I, I can talk about it. it I, I can. It's uh, I'm doing a little bit of a, a very exciting project in uh, on the uh, yeah. Hokkaido Island in Japan. I think and, I'm going to uh, need the, to visit the, you there. Yes. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. You have to come visit because uh, the vineyard is about um, 45 minutes from um, from this those great um, great fluffy powder there. So um, uh, I'm your man, man. Um, <laughs> uh, so hope for, the, uh, hope for, for the, the, everything to reopen by uh, by then in yeah. uh, on on the California mountain for sure. No, it's really exciting to hear that you're working on a project in Japan and there's so much exciting wine um, growing happening there. And, and every winemaker I know that goes and does work in Japan talks about the skiing. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah. So that, that'll, be, that'll be a lot of fun. Um, just to clarify one thing, the, the change in vine training that we were just talking about at Stony Hill and Hansel helps increase airflow while also um, decreasing sun exposure in the fruit zone. And, um, and, and so as a way of helping maintaining a cooler growing zone for, for the vines um, as temperatures change and also helps protect the fruit during weather changes. Is there anything else you'd want to add to that explanation, either of you? That's really spot on. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we are unfortunately out of time. There's so much more that um, we could talk about with both of you. Both of you have worked with Chardonnay vineyards all over the state and, and um, you know, hearing your thoughts on, on what stands out in these two sites, it's really quite special. I appreciate your willingness to, um, to forcibly look at each other for this hour and taste and taste and talk about each other's wines. I really appreciate both of you making time. I've been able, you know, to spend time with each of you and talk about your wines, but to have, have you here to talk about your wines really is an honor. So thank you to both of you. My oh, pleasure. Thank you for having us. It's quite, yeah. quite so fun. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for signing in. We know that um, things are ever changing in the world right now. And, and it's really, um, quite a pleasure to be able to bring this time to all of you. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Yes, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, McNeil. Uh, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and all participants will receive an email with the link. So we hope you will join us next week uh, as we welcome Sarah Wuthrich of Maggie Hawk to talk Pinot Noir and the Anderson Valley. That'll be next Tuesday, June 16th at 10 a.m. Pacific. So thank you all. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.